So in the previous lecture, we talked about something which we called uh, PCA or principal component analysis. Um, and what I would like to do now is uh, uh, refer to this problem from a more axiomatic point of view. And it goes as follows. Assume that you have uh, a set of vectors. So you have M vectors, uh, each, one, each one of size Rn. So you have, uh, so five, five, seven, for example, would look like uh, uh, there is uh, one element, two element, three element, there are n such, uh, small n such elements, okay? And what I would like is to somehow find a basis, a common basis uh, that would allow me to represent these vectors in the most efficient way, in the regular way. So that if we truncate the basis, the MSC error would be as small as possible, picking any uh, vector from this basis, okay? Or, um, so what can we do? And we don't know how we choose the vector from this basis. So what do we do? We, we would like to find the basis. So let's describe the basis as a matrix P where each column in this matrix would be my, uh, the elements of my basis. So this, for example, would be my beta one, this would be my beta two, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is my, uh, this is my basis. Now, projecting onto this basis and writing it in matrix form would be nothing but taking the vector psi i, projecting it onto the matrix P, and then I also need to represent it, to represent the, 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 the projection in the, in the basis P, so it would be uh, multiplying it by P, okay? So what am I doing here? I'm taking the uh, P transpose would, be, would have beta one here and beta two here, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And it would multiply my vector psi uh, one that would be a vector that looks like that. So uh, the outcome of this multiplication, which is p transpose times psi i, for example, would be a coefficient. Now, what you would like to do is uh, multiply this coefficient by uh, the specific vector, and this vector would now be my um, my beta one vector that would be here. Okay, so the first coefficient would multiply all the beta ones, the second coefficient would multiply all the beta twos. And this is why uh, what you see here uh, on the left is in fact uh, exactly what we would like to do. Now, what is our, again, what I'm doing is just writing in matrix form our, um, our uh, the idea of representing uh, vectors in some space by a compact and efficient matrix, aka the PCA idea. Now, we would like this representation, so this would be an approximation or representation of uh, psi i. I mean, we could truncate the basis at any number of coefficients and then just refer to it as a truncated basis. And we would like this one, the error, to be as small as possible. And what we would like to have is to have this one minimized for all our uh, vectors, i equals one to capital N, okay? So what we would like uh, is to minimize this, uh, 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 this guy, this is the MSE. Uh, we are looking for a basis, let's call it P, and we know that P uh, transpose P is equal to identity. It, it, is a, it is a basis. And the question is, how do we optimize that? So let me write uh, in matrix notation, and, and I'm just reminding you that the uh, trace, uh, well, well, we'll get back to it when, when we need it. Um, so what can we uh, write? We can write uh, P, P transpose um, psi i uh, minus psi i, and this one would be transpose times P, P transpose psi i, minus psi i transpose. This is, this is what is written over here. Let's open this, uh, the brackets here. So what I have here, I mean, let's write it as, as follows. We have uh, uh, P, so what we'll have here is psi i transpose P, P transpose minus psi i transpose. And this would multiply by P, P transpose psi i minus psi i. Okay, now we have to uh, open these brackets. So what we have is that uh, 
this guy times that guy, that guy would be psi i transpose. Now we have p. p transpose times p is nothing but the identity. So I have identity, and all I have is p transpose psi i. Okay. Now and obviously when uh, all, all these guys are vectors. Now I have this guy times that guy, so it would be minus psi i transpose uh, p, p transpose psi i. Now we have uh, uh, this guy times that guy, which would be minus psi transpose p, p transpose uh, psi i. Uh, plus psi i transpose psi i, okay? Now, what you can see is that uh, one of these guys would basically cancel out. And what we are left is with this uh, term that we would like to minimize, okay? So we would like to minimize. And the argument that we would like to minimize uh, with respect to is nothing but my, my p, my, my basis. Now, the basis obviously is independent of that term. I mean, that term has nothing to do with the basis. So what I need to do is basically, so the, the arg min problem would be equivalent to arg max. Uh, I'm taking away the plus here, the minus here and making a plus out of it. So I would like to maximize uh, psi transpose uh, P P transpose psi, psi i. Okay, and th there should be a sum over all the i's that I have, okay? i equal one to capital M. And capital M could be as large as I want. Okay, are you with me? And this is my P here. So let's turn to a new page. And uh, what we have again is my, uh, this is my arg max problem that I would like to optimize i equals one to capital M. Here I have uh, psi i transpose uh, p, p transpose psi i. Okay, and what I would like to optimize is with respect to p such that p transpose p is equal to one, is equal to identity, okay, such that. Now, this guy at the end of the day is, uh, um, is a scalar that we would like to optimize, but I would like to have uh, some notion of uh, matrix multiplication to the problem. So what I would use is the fact that if I have uh, A transpose B, um, then it would be equivalent to the trace of the outer product of B A transpose, okay? And if I do that, then it would be equivalent I'm just referring to the to the to this part. The sum would come afterwards without any difficulty. So it would be equivalent to p p transpose times uh, psi i psi i transpose. Okay, and remember this is the outer product, and we also have the sum of uh, i equals one to m here. Now. The only thing that has to do with the, with the sum, with the, uh, the sum uh, over i is this part. So let's zoom in into this part. So this part would be nothing but sum i equals one to capital M of psi i times psi i transpose, which is to say I am taking psi i, this would be the element of my psi i, and I'm taking the outer product with psi i transpose, which is something like that. So the outcome would be a matrix, um, an, uh, an n by n matrix, whose first element would be the multiplication of these two elements. The second element would be the multiplication of these two elements, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this would be the outer product of each and every uh, vector that I have in my data. And I sum over all my, uh, all my vectors. And now without loss of generality, let's call it an autocorrelation matrix, but you know, just refer to it as a matrix R, okay? So this would be my matrix R. Um, so the problem at the end of the day boils down to arg max of P, P transpose that should be equal to R.
Okay, this would be my R. Now you can fill the, uh, so we are looking for P such that uh, P is autonormal. And, and this is my minimization, my maximization in this case problem. Now we resort to our, um, uh, to our, um, the composition problem. I mean, we remember that we can write R in some cases as U, uh, some diagonal matrix, uh, U transpose. Okay, so this is, I mean, just diagonalize the, the, the outer correlation matrix or something that I refer to as the outer correlation matrix. So some approximation of the outer correlation matrix, and this is what you'd get, where U's are unitary matrices, orthogonal matrices, autonomous matrices. And indeed- Can I ask something? Yeah, sorry. Um, how can you maximize, uh, this is a matrix at the end of the day. So how do you optimize a matrix? Like what's the, the madad, the measure that you want to maximize here? Well, the, the, uh, this is a trace, okay, sorry. Oh, okay. So this is a number now. This is a number, yeah. This is the okay. trace of this guy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is a trace, it's very important. Okay, this is, this is how, uh, I mean, again, uh, moving from here to here, sorry for that, there is a trace here. Thank you, who was that that uh, made the comment? Yagel. Yeah, 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 so add yourself a point. Um, so at the end of the day, what we are doing, and again, let me just zoom into that part, oh, sorry, into that part, is optimizing the trace, I mean, maximizing the trace of that one. Okay, so I have uh, the trace of P, P transpose, and here I have U, uh, some eigenvalues, and let's uh, order the eigenvalues from the largest to the smallest, okay? U transpose. Now, the P, the P transpose, the U, and the U transpose are just rotation matrices, okay? These are basis matrices. I mean, they, they do nothing to the magnitude of the trace at the end of the day. The only thing they can do is distribute these numbers in a different manner uh, along, the, along the diagonal. I mean, what we can actually see is that the trace is equal to uh, P transpose U, and here I have the same lambdas, and here I have U transpose P, okay? So the only thing I can do is take these magnitudes and distribute them differently along the diagonal. Now, uh, by by some averaging, I mean I cannot I cannot uh, I cannot pull uh, values from this eigenvalue back to the uh, back to the first one. Okay, and this is something that we have shown in the previous lecture. Okay, because this would be equal to the trace. So what we can do, I mean, in the trace we can, I mean, trace of uh, a b is nothing but a trace of the A. Okay. So what we can do is basically uh, uh, end up uh, by choosing P to be equivalent, exactly equivalent to U, because this would preserve the largest magnitude at the first eigenvalue, okay? So the only selection, you can also uh, come to the same conclusion from the point of view of using the Riley quotient, and then the best way of, uh, of uh, representing, uh, of finding P is the eigen decomposition of R, but in our case, it's um, uh, it's even simpler in in a sense because the only the only solution that we can have is is choosing P to be equivalent to U, and the right order would be from the largest eigen uh, value to the smallest eigen value. I mean, the way by which we are selecting, we are ordering the elements of P would be selecting the the one that corresponds to the largest eigen value first, and then those that correspond to the rest of the eigen. So this is a motivation for why summing over the uh, outer product of my uh, vectors of my data would be in a sense an approximation for the outer correlation matrix. And this would be uh, a reason of why uh, decomposing the outer correlation matrix indeed would give me the best uh, in an incremental manner way of representing my data. Now, before we, got, we get into, uh, into more complicated stuff, and uh, 
going into 30,000 feet in order to talk a little bit about, I promise Sean to talk a little bit about compression. Uh, let me ask you the following question. Assume that you have a curve, okay, a planar curve, a curve in the plane. And the curve in the plane is given by points, by a set of points, a sequence of points of X and Y points, okay? So these would be the points of my uh, curve. And you can think of them as two vectors. One of them would be X, I, where I goes from one to N. And the other one would be yi, or i goes from one to n, or x, where x1, uh, uh, or x1, y1 would be, for example, this guy. Okay, this would be x2, y2, etc., etc. Okay, so this is my set of points that represents a planar curve. And, and uh, usually a curve is denoted at C, where CI represents the point uh, X, I, Y, I, the couple X, I, Y, I. Now assume, uh, so this is the input, okay? So this is the input to the problem. Now assume that I'm giving you the following process. The, follow, the, the process is taking the uh, curve C as input. So I have this kind of a filter and the input is the curve C, the set of all points CI. And the output would be taking uh, every triplet of points, so taking uh, CI, taking every CI and replacing it by the average of uh, CI minus one plus CI plus CI plus one divided by three which means that I'm taking every three consecutive points and I'm looking if I would zoom in into these points. So what I would actually do, uh, let me choose a different color. I would look at the average of the three points. So you can think of an imaginary triangle and what I would do is basically replace each and every point by the center of mass of the three consecutive points, okay? So think about this process. So this is the process, let's call it H. And the output would be uh, C, um, uh, uh, where H is applied to, to C, okay? And now the problem goes as follows. Assume that I'm applying H again and again and again onto C, okay? How would the output look like? So I'm applying H n number of times onto C. How would single, the output look like? A single dot? A simple dot, yet. but what would be the shape of this? Uh, so uh, who was that, Gal? Yes. So Gal is saying that, yeah, if I'm taking every three points and taking the average of the three points, there, at the end of the day, it would converge to some center of mass of something. But I would like to know what would be the shape of the center of mass. How would I do, how would I do the analysis of the shape? Would it look fractal like that? Would it look circular? Would it look, I mean, what kind of a shape would it be? I, and I'm not looking for the final answer. I'm just looking for the way. And I would like to see how you think. And you have all the, I mean, you have most of the machinery uh, by tools that we have explored in this course. So this is a hint. If, if I'm, so one by one, Gal. I didn't say anything. I think it will be a circle. Yeah. So this is the run? Mm -hmm. It will uh, over time be more and more like circle. So this is, this is what is known as guesstimation. Um, the answer is obviously not, otherwise I would not have asked that, but, but uh, the question is how would you analyze it? Forget about the final solution. Let's see. Let's so you can treat H as a convolution with an averaging filter of uh, three, three entries each time. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how we continue from there to analyze the matrix uh, to a power. I guess we can decompose it to a, a, a spectral analysis of, of the, the matrix, uh, unitary matrix, uh, eigenvalues in a unitary matrix, and then 
the power of it would be only the power of the unit of the eigenvalues matrix. So thank you, Sean. This is a well-deserved point. So what Sean was suggesting is the following. What we see here is basically a convolution operator, okay? And the curve is in fact a cyclic, a periodic uh, vector. I mean, the fact that I started here doesn't mean that I end here. I mean, the average of these three points would be the average of uh, x n minus one, x n and x one. So I have a periodic function. So in fact, h would be nothing but a cyclic convolution, okay? So it would be, it would be an operator that looks like that. And what do we know about these kind of operators? I mean, this is a circulant matrix. So this is how H would look like. What do we know about circulant matrix? How, how is it diagonalized? By the Fourier. Yeah, so we know that the Fourier, uh, we call it DFT, uh, is diagonalizing this kind of matrix, okay? And one of them should be uh, transposed, should be conjugated, okay? So we know uh, how H looks like. So we know how H to the power of N would look like. We, what we can do is we can do, uh, let's call this one U, okay? So we have U transpose lambda U, U transpose uh, lambda U, etc., cetera, et cetera. We, hand, we have this multiplication n, n times. And since U is uh, unitary, these guys would go away. And what we have is that we have u lambda to the power of n, u, and, and this would be uh, uh, h to the power of n, okay? So the only thing that we need to do is observe how the first uh, two eigenvalues uh, of the, uh, the composition of, uh, of uh, one, 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 and zeros at the end would look like take the power, uh, the nth power, and then what, we what you would see is that, it would con is that there is a dominant uh, first eigenvalue and then there is a second one. And in fact, uh, it would not be a circle, but rather an ellipse, okay? So it would converge into, into an, ellip an ellipse. Uh, and this is something that, um, uh, that is quite simple to analyze with all the tools that we have learned uh, in this course. Okay, now, um, just again, uh, talking a little bit, um, giving a little bit of motivation of what we have learned until now. What we learned until now is that if, for example, we have size, okay, vectors or functions such that the gradient. Can, can I ask another question before? Um, how, how come it, it's an ellipsis? How can you. Uh, what, you need to see, what you need to look um, is at the first, first eigenvalues lambda one and lambda two, okay? You need to look at what, what is going on with the, uh, when you take the power, the, when n is going to infinity, okay? And if, for example, the ratio between lambda one and lambda two is a constant, uh, then it would become an ellipse where you can measure the, uh, when you can uh, measure the, uh, the aspect ratio of this matrix. Um, Usually it would not be a constant, but rather a lambda one would converge. Well, I mean, when you normalize, uh, when you look at this ratio, uh, lambda two would converge to zero much faster than lambda one. Uh, then it would mean that the first, um, it would mean that, uh, um, I mean, okay. In which case would it, would, would it become, would it be a circle? Okay. If lambda one uh, divided by lambda two would have been one, then we would be really, really lucky and, um, and we would uh, obtain a circle at the end of the day. Can remember, remember that this guy is multiplying my uh, x's and my y's, okay? So you can think about it as taking the Fourier of the x's, then multiplying them with a diagonal uh, uh, matrix who has only one dominant value so if there is only one dominant value, it would be some average with respect to this dominant value of all the uh, entries that I have here for the X as well as for the Y. So it would converge to the center of mass in a sense. Okay. Next. So what we mentioned is that if we have our size such that we know that the 
derivative when you integrate over time uh, is, is, is somehow bounded, then uh, we show that if we use the, uh, the Fourier harmonics to represent this kind of a function, uh, then it would be optimal in the sense of uh, finding uh, an approximation minus projecting this approximation. So it would be phi minus uh, the inner product of phi with my Fourier basis. At i, and here I have this sum of i equals one to k. Then we mentioned that if uh, we have uh, a less restrictive way of looking, uh, and, and we uh, wrote it as, okay, this was called the Dirichle energy. And the reason was that if you, uh, if you look at, uh, at what is written here from a matrix point of view, then you can write the derivative, the first order derivative as something like that. And then uh, looking at the integration would be, uh, I mean, the square of this guy would be something like uh, psi transpose d transpose d. Okay, d is the derivative operator psi. And this is nothing but the Laplacian. Okay. And now we can do the, the trace trick again and show that what we would like to do is minimize or maximize, uh, minimize in this case the trace of. Uh, the Laplacian uh, psi transpose psi. And what we were looking at the end of the day is for a basis here. I mean, the Laplacian in this case, give, in this case is given. And what we would like to, to do is uh, find the basis by which we are representing these guys. So at the end of the day, uh, what we need to do is somehow find the betas that would be the diagonalization of the Laplacian. Okay, so and choosing them in an ascending order rather than descending order. Uh, so this was a related problem to the uh, to the PCA, but this is a really um, a really large family of functions. Okay, so for this kind of relatively smooth functions, uh, what we need to do uh, is look for uh, the eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator of the Laplacian, and what we get are the harmonics. Uh, we obtain the harmonics because uh, we need to have our, uh, we, we assume that uh, at, at the boundary of a periodic uh, domain, uh, the, the data has to be equal to zero. And then solving this kind of, um, of uh, beta i, which is equal to zero, to some, to some zero at the boundary. Uh, this is my omega. So at the boundary, uh, the only solutions were at the end of the day, uh, the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, okay? And, and we have shown numerically that indeed, if, if we plug it in, then it would be a minimization of, uh, of the Dirichlet energy. Now, what we can do is in fact, uh, ask the following question. Assume that we would like as before to minimize uh, for a set of functions, our representation uh, and here we have our uh, psi i's. So this would be the, uh, the reason for the PCA. But now what I would like to have is that the basis elements themselves should be as smooth as possible, okay? So it seems that I would like to regularize to somehow smooth the element to add some smoothness uh, assumption to the elements of the, um, uh, of the PCA. So what I can do is like, I can add another penalty here that will tell me, look, if you sum over the elements, let's call the vectors PI. So PI would be my BI's here. So if I'm looking at just the PI's, the vectors of P, so P was a set of basis elements. So this was be P1 and P2, et cetera, et cetera. And assume that I know the coordinates by which, uh, uh, by which PI is given to me. So I would like to find those for which the Dirichle energy of these PIs is as smooth as possible, okay? So assume that now that I have some coordinate system, that there is some importance to the way that the elements in the vectors are ordered, 
assume for example that I have my curve or something like that so I can define a Laplacian for this set of points in this case I can end regularity and I here should be one to n and is the number of uh, elements that I have in the matrix P and I usually add some uh, arbitrary scalar here so this would be the PCA part this would be the guy that would produce for me the Fourier in the usual sense and putting them together is a very natural and very effective way of regularizing the PCA element. So this would be a smoothing operator. Okay, and this is called regularized PCA. Uh, and if you don't trust your data too much and you, would, uh, and you have coordinate system that you do trust, then use this. I mean, this is a really powerful tool uh, to regularize your PCAs, okay? Uh, and obviously, when lambda is really large, you would get the Fourier, and when lambda is really small, you would get the, back the PCA. You would trust more the uh, autocorrelation matrix, the second order statistics that you are approximating uh, for your data. Um, now, let's think. Uh, yesterday, we had an interesting talk with a physician who is a, an electrophysiologist, and what he wanted to do uh, is analyze um, uh, ECG. Uh, the the, um, the, electro the electromagnetic uh, pulses that the heart is, uh, is producing. And you can measure that. Today, if you have an, uh, uh, an Apple Watch or something like that, you can just touch it and you get these uh, profiles. And uh, if these profiles, so they, they, are, they are usually periodic, so they look at something that looks like that. And um, the question is, would Fourier analysis, I mean, would representing this basis in the Fourier space would be the optimal, uh, the optimal solution? And the answer is obviously no, because we know more about the signal. So we have the second order statistics and we have more information about the signal. And, and in fact, we can do other, we can apply other tool to this problem. So if, for example, so again, Remember that uh, the, the PCA, sorry, the PCA and the Fourier or the smooth, uh, the smooth vectors are optimal with respect to either uh, this measure or that measure. Now assume, assume that somebody is telling me, and, and this by the way would hold in any dimension, any dimension. Okay, this is a very general, theorem, the uh, Poincaré uh, trick to prove the optimality of the smoothness or the PCA is invariant, is independent of which dimension you are working in. So this is a really, really powerful tool and you should remember that. Now, for about two decades, people uh, were really interested in one dimensional signals that looked like that. So they were smooth and there was a sudden uh, discontinuity and then they were smooth and then another sudden discontinuity and smooth and another sudden discontinuity. So these were one dimensional signals. And for one dimensional signals, it appears that there is something that looks like your HAR signals. Uh, and this is um, an overcomplete basis that was called wavelets. And wavelets were shown to be optimal in capturing these phenomena. Okay, these abrupt changes from one smooth version to another. So assume that the number of these uh, discontinuities is somehow bounded, so you don't have infinite of them, but rather a finite of them. The question is, what is the, uh, um, what is the uh, rate of decay of representing, uh, of having an error uh, as a function of number of uh, wavelets of functions that of basis functions that we are adding to the game. And it appears that wavelets were really, really optimal uh, for one dimensional signals. I'm not going to uh, present the, um, the infrastructure of how you create wavelets, but remember that they were optimal, but they were optimal only for one dimensional signals. Now, people were so in love uh, with the fact for, I would say even three or four decades with the fact that something like that, it can even exist that you can work in this crazy, uh, but yet rel relatively general spaces that they immediately say, let's apply it to images in 2D. 
But in 2D, they were not, they are not, they aren't a, a direct extensions of wavelets to 2D uh, because they were uh, proven to be optimal only for one dimensional signals. So what they did is they took uh, the, these basis functions, let's not, uh, let's call them beta, and they did a cross product. So they did beta along the x direction and then beta along the y direction, exactly as we did for the Fourier, but in the Fourier it's completely legitimate because uh, you get, you, you still preserve the optimality criterion. Now, what happens when you apply this uh, optimality criteria twice, it would mean that uh, this kind of cross product of basis functions would be optimal in representing images for which you have these continuities, which are centered at points, okay? So if you have these continuities at points, then these wavelets would uh, really be optimal. Why? Because first of all, you get this continuity when you go along uh, this direction. And then you also have to apply on the output of this filter, the filter that uh, walks in this direction. So you can, I, you can focus your uh, discontinuity at, at points. But we know that natural images, at least in the natural images that we are aware of, you have edges, you have boundaries between objects. So you can think of an image as a piecewise smooth uh, object. Okay, so we have, for example, Assume that this is a table and this is something else, okay? So in images, we have edges. We have, uh, this would be, if we zoom in, this would be uh, one region of uh, smoothness. And the black part would be another region of, of smoothness, okay? So we don't have events like that where we have just uh, points where we have these communities, but rather we have edges. And a very long time, this community of wavelets were busy in translating the optimality of 1D to the 2D case. I'm not even talking about 3D case, okay? And how did they, they do that? Uh, you could find um, um, things like ridgelets and edgelets. And my, one of my colleagues wa was joking about, uh, and, and you can have uh, uh, many, many kinds of uh, variations of lets at the end. And somebody said that they are going to invest the toilets. Um, so, so the question, so this was a joke, okay? Don't, uh, don't go to the press with that. Um, so the question was, was what can we do with, with uh, I mean, what, what was the essence behind this kind of, of, uh, of compression ideas? So one of them was saying, look, find all the edges. Let's let some Oracle find for you all the edges in the image and then do the compression only in an orthogonal way to the edges, okay? And since at the time it was 90 something, I had a really cool algorithm for finding edges. I was invited to all the approximation theory uh, conferences to present my, my findings. Another one, for example, Emmanuel Candes and, and uh, Dave Donohoe, what they did is uh, they showed that uh, there is an algorithm, there is a transform that takes straight lines in an image and converts them into points. Okay, this is called a Radon transform. Okay, the Radon transform or the half transform takes, takes straight line in an image and uh, uh, converts it into, into, uh, into a point. So this would be great. I mean, if I could now apply a wavelet transform to the uh, Radon transform that is operating on my image, assume that I'm calling my image U, or we'll call, we'll call our image Psi as we used to, okay? So we do wavelet on Radon, on Psi, and, and uh, this would be a great way of coding edges in an image, but, but the Radon transform has this really terrible effect of taking points and translating the points into lines. And the wavelet transform would be terrible uh, in, uh, in uh, representing lines. So what Candes and Dono suggested is, look, you do two of them, you apply two of them. First of all, do the wavelet transform to your original image. Then do the wavelet transform to the, uh, to the Radon transform of the image. And now let these two guys compete, okay? and uh, take the large coefficients from this guy and take the large coefficients from that guy and use both of them in order to reconstruct the image. I mean, the largest coefficient from that guy 
would reconstruct the edges and the largest coefficient from that guy would reconstruct the points. Okay, and this is what they tried to do. It was a great idea. There is an implementation of it. The problem is that it was really inefficient practically in uh, representing images. Why? Because of many reasons. Because of the fact that the uh, two dimensional uh, wavelet transform was not uh, optimal in, uh, in, in uh, the rate of convergence in representing two dimensional signals. Now, saying that, I can tell you that, for example, if you look at uh, the compression algorithms out there, uh, there is the JPEG, uh, the usual JPEG transform that probably most of you are familiar with. And in the JPEG transform, what is going on is the following. Uh, you take really small eight by eight or 16 by 16 uh, patches of the image. Okay, so you can get only eight by eight, where the autocorrelation uh, matrix of these eight by eight uh, patches is, has a really generic form. In fact, it has a form that looks almost like a circulant matrix. We call it uh, stationary in uh, whatever sense. Okay, okay. And if you uh, take the generic autocorrelation matrix of this, of this uh, matrix, you'd get something that looks like the Fourier. And people uh, uh, decided that from an implementation point of view, they prefer uh, real values. So what they did is they just took the real value of the Fourier and they took the cosine transform, okay? So they took the cosine transform of these eight by eight vectors. And the cosine transform is, again, is a cross product of cosine along the X and cosine along the Y. And then what happens is that you can order these cosine transforms as this would be the uh, coefficient. So we have our, again, our betas, beta i's, and we have 64 of them, okay? Okay, why? Because, uh, because we have 64 pixels. So you can think about it as a large vector of 64 pixels, and you can think of these two dimensional cosine transform as, as uh, cosine is in this, uh, in this uh, 64 dimensional. Uh, space. So at the end of the day, we'll have a 64 uh, coefficients. And these coefficients could be ordered from the first one that multiplies the constant image. Then you have a uh, uh, cosine that goes only along that direction. Then you have a cosine that goes only along that direction. And then the, the diagonal direction. So these would be the frequencies along the x directions. These would be the frequencies along the y directions. And these would be the mixed and the, the more you go to the right, the higher the frequency gets. Now, we learned that for smooth signals, usually uh, uh, we should look at frequencies that are departing in, a, some, in some nice fashion from the origin, okay? And indeed, when you try to code a JPEG image, what people have been doing is taking only uh, the upper part of, the, uh, of this uh, 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 projections of the patch uh, into these cosine transforms, uh, taking only the first three or the first whatever. Now, this was a great idea. I mean, it, was, it completely uh, coincided with the optimality criteria of uh, looking at how an image looks like. And when you look at a small enough patch, then uh, the probability is nice. But from a perceptual point of view, people were really preferring uh, horizontal and vertical lines rather than diagonal lines. So what happened is that instead of taking these uh, coefficients in a circular manner, what happens is at the end of the day, uh, the coefficients were taken in, in uh, an order like that, okay? So this was the first, this was the second, then the third, and then you picked rather than this one, you picked that one. And this was sort of perceptual way of weighing the coefficients of the cosine transform. Now, when you talk about quality uh, using JPEG, you, you influence two things. One of them is how many coefficients uh, you take within this, uh, within this transform. I mean, JPEG is a lossy uh, compression, uh, compression idea. So you throw away uh, all these guys usually. And then what happens is that you uh, walk along these coefficients and you uh, use, it's called run length coding, I mean, um, and, and you use, so, so it's a little bit more complicated. What you do is you take, first of all, the DC, the average of your signal, and you take the DC of all the patches in the image, 
and you try to uh, to code them with something which is called run, run next coding, and then uh, you code all the other coefficients with some other entropy coding trick. But the number of coefficients that you're picking and how you distribute the bits to this kind of coefficients, which is exactly what we learned in this uh, in this uh, course, is how JPEG works. Okay, this is exactly the infrastructure behind JPEG. Now, JPEG was uh, an interesting way of uh, implementing almost everywhere that we have learned in this course and a little bit more because we didn't talk about entropy, entropy coders. So entropy coders is something that you could learn in um, information theory courses. Uh, but again, uh, the only thing that you need to know here is something like the Huffman code. The more frequent a number is, the more bits you want to assign to it, okay? And, and, uh, now, there, there is also lossless JPEG. And the lossless JPEG is called LOCO. Um, it is an algorithm which is completely different than this one that was invented by three um, Israelis. I mean, each of them has an Israeli uh, passport, so they are Israeli. Um, uh, uh, one of them is Guillermo Sapir, a good colleague of mine. And using this kind of lossless JPEG is how the Pathfinder uh, transmit his, transmits his images from Mars. So uh, he, the, the images uh, on Mars are taken by this camera and uh, the Mars rover is compressing it, it, the, the images using this kind of, uh, of compression. Now, if in the JPEG compression, you could get 10, 20, even 100 uh, compression rates, I mean, counting the initial numbers and counting the final numbers at the end, you can get two order of magnitudes compression. With the local, you could get, I would say five, probably 10, uh, uh, 10 um, um, factor of compressing the number of bits. How does the local uh, works? Since, since it's not really related to our course, uh, I will just mention it in a brief. Uh, it raster scans the image. So it goes over the image from uh, top to bottom, left to right. And when it gets to a point, it looks at the neighboring points. Okay, so it looks at this pixel, that pixel, that pixel, and I would say also this pixel. And it would try to estimate whether there is an edge going somewhere in, in this small patch uh, that, that, it, 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 that, uh, that it looks at. Okay, now if there is an edge, it would give an estimation to this pixel as the pixel that belong to the segment uh, uh, that is uh, segmented by this edge. And then the residual, the, the subtracting the value of the actual pixel from the estimation would go into an entropy coding, okay? So it would hopefully be a really small number and it would uh, be decorrelated. So it would be something like a random noise. And hopefully uh, this is how the, um, I mean, they could show that uh, uh, this kind of entropy coding uh, uh, converges in the sense of uh, in, in the limit to the entropy coding, uh, and they also practically get relatively good compression rates. Okay, so this was a side note. Um, now I mentioned about wavelets that it was optimal. I mean, let's do it like that. It was it was uh, optimal for one of these signals but it was not optimal for 2D signals. I mean, people tried to make it optimal, but it was not. Now, in images, there was, there was, there was also uh, JPEG 2000, which is a really, uh, and it took from, I would say from 50, the compression rates to, I would say even 300, it was a really good algorithm for compressing images, okay? Now the JPEG 2000, surprise, surprise, used wavelets. But it was using wavelets in, an, in a really unorthodox, unorthodox way. Um, the, the nice thing about wavelets is that like Fourier, they have this multi-scale structure, okay? So what the... JPEG 2000 people uh, were, were doing, um, and in fact, even before that, they used something uh, basically that's called zero tree or, and the idea is 
and, and um, I think David Taubman was the, uh, the one that eventually uh, pushed the JPEG 2000 uh, standard. It is now used, for example, in, compress in compressing a really high resolution image, for example, in the uh, IMAX videos, the uh, movies that you're uh, uh, looking for at. Uh, I think the compression standard, at, le at least until a couple of years ago, was JPEG 2000. Probably today they're using some other methods, but so what was so magical about the wavelets and how did they use it in JPEG 2000, although it was not optimal. The fact that uh, you have a multi-scale structure means that um, you can look at the phenomena. I mean, assume that I have something like that here. So this is a boundary between uh, a dark object and a white object. So if I look at it at really fine resolution or at really coarse resolution, I would probably get similar uh, similar coefficients. So what they did is they said, look, in a wavelet transform, what you do is you look at, um, at low resolution of the image and you try to code it. And then you go to high resolution of the image and you try to code the left to right and the, uh, the left, upper left, upper low and diagonal um, structure of the image. And what they said that if in the low resolution of the image, there was a uh, uh, um, there was a coefficient that had high uh, that had high value. Then we estimated that at the same location in the other resolution, you would have this. Um, uh, the, there is a high probability of getting high uh, of getting an efficient way of uh, looking at this at, at this coefficient. So in fact, what you look is you look at the uh, wavelet coefficients as a tree, and then you prune them. You look at all the small ones and you basically prune them. You basically throw away. And then the question is, how should I code uh, this tree of coefficient of coefficients? And it appears that if I have a coefficient here, the probability of having a corresponding coefficient at the lower image is something that I can code in an efficient way. So the JPEG 2000 was not using the wavelet as the infrastructure, but rather the multi-scale feature of the wavelets as, the, as, as an efficient way of uh, looking at, uh, at, this, at, at these coefficients. Now, if, for example, you, you would take a cartoon image, okay? So if you take an image that looks uh, red here, blue there, and then you have another one that looks like that. So the edges would not be smooth anymore, and therefore they would be captured by just a single resolution, uh, and you fit them into a JPEG 2000 algorithm, the result that you would get would look terrible. I mean, it would really look, I mean, if you look at cartoons, at classical cartoons, and you apply JPEG 2000 on them, they would look um, uh, a disaster. They would look like a disaster. So, so this was JPEG. This was JPEG 2000. I was also mentioning uh, the loco. Uh, before we get into the break, let me also mention um, the uh, MPEG. MPEG or motion JPEG is a family of methods that is using the, uh, the dependencies of images a long time. So if I'm looking at a sequence of images or a sequence of functions, and I'm looking at how they are related, then usually uh, if I'm considering the human eye, if there is somebody that is uh, uh, doing something like that here at the next image, the hand would probably move just a little bit. So if there is a mechanism that captures this part and telling me, look, in the next image, this, um, uh, this kind of a window would move, uh, would move epsilon to the right and epsilon to the left, I mean, would shift uh, in, in this specific order. Um, and then uh, if you use this as an initial estimation of your next image, uh, then you can do really magic. I mean, uh, the residual would always be uh, relatively small and you can in fact use this residual in order to fit it into an entropy coding, a coder and it would uh, really give really small numbers if you do this uh, motion estimation for vectors. Uh, uh, in, a, in a reliable way, okay? So in the MPEG, what you're using is small patches that you try to estimate how they are moving. Uh, this is how you tile your image. So the next image would look at the previous one and would look at, at these motion estimation vectors. And uh, these motion estimation vectors would tell you uh, uh, how you move the previous 
patches from the previous image. And usually you send, uh, it's called an iframe, a reference frame every couple of frames. It could be a really large number of frames. So if, for example, you play your video and you want to jump ahead and you uh, uh, fix into a point and you see this blurry image that looks terrible, you know that what is going on is that you're now just looking at the motion vectors and you have to wait for this reference image to come uh, before the MPEG is starting to operate right again, okay? So good players should sense the fact that uh, what they are looking at is something which is nothing but motion estimation without the reference image, and they should go backwards and look for the reference image in order to, uh, in order to reconstruct what you're looking at. Now, how to code these patches uh, has many, many flavors. Most of them are cosine uh, transform based or discrete cosine transform or some har or har, har like uh, functions. Uh, it depends on the complexity of your, uh, of your uh, algorithm. There is also motion JPEG uh, algorithms. The previous cameras that were incapable of compressing in real time MPEG movies were using motion JPEG. Uh, then you got really huge volumes of uh, really large number of bits in order to represent your uh, videos, uh, because the only thing that this motion JPEG was doing is using the previous image as an estimation for the next one. So if you don't code the motion vectors, uh, then and the only thing uh, that you're using is the current image as a predictor for the next one, and you do the following. For example, assume that you move your camera like that, then you'd get really terrible, uh, really terrible effects. In fact, in most of the current uh, Celera phones, even in the most advanced ones, if you use the uh, most powerful uh, way of looking at, vi at a video and you uh, pan your image, you move your uh, image like that, the outcome, the compression rates that you would get, I mean, estimating the right motion and doing everything in a smooth manner would be really painful and you would get really terrible effects uh, along the way. So motion estimation is something which is painful. Um, and again, uh, unluckily, I would say that even in the most advanced um, iPhone, iPhone 12, which is the best motion compression that I've seen and in the pixel of Google's pixel, uh, where the guy that is running the zoom in, zoom out uh, group there is Pema Milan for a good colleague of, of ours. Um, it's not there yet. I mean, it's not, it's, not, um, it's not the way that you would like to see it on a 60 inch uh, display, okay? So this was, and, and by the way, since I would say the eighties, Nothing has changed or nothing substantial has changed uh, in, uh, in the MPEG. I mean, if you look at the H264 uh, and then 265, it was only, it was mainly an issue of how you transit between scales of the image, between different resolution of the image. I mean, if the bandwidth is now lower, then you uh, uh, smoothly fall into a lower rate of transmitting your data. But the fundamental idea of doing motion estimation and then, and then uh, transform coding of uh, the residue of the, uh, of the images is something which is fundamentally there. It's not, it hasn't changed. Now, now what happens is that we have a new kind of data. We usually have uh, the RGB images, which is translated often to uh, YCBCR. Y is usually the intensity and CBCR are the uh, colors at each and every image. Now the Y, the intensity or the um, achromatic channel is usually used with a higher resolution. In JPEG, for example, uh, the colors that are used uh, by only two coordinates use a lower resolution because it appears that the human eye is less sensitive to colors than to the intensity. So usually if you look at an image and you uh, transform it from RGB to YCBCR, you'd get a really high resolution intensity image and then a really low resolution, I mean, probably half the resolution of the color channels, of the chromatic channels. By the way, the fact that the human perception can settle with only two parameters in order to code the colors is very interesting. And those of you who would take an advanced course 
uh, about uh, how to flatten phenomena into how to put phenomena onto flat domains uh, would learn about the tool that enabled uh, psychophysical researchers to come to the conclusions that two, uh, two numbers are enough in order to capture the human color perception. Okay, but this is how the pipeline is going on. You take an RGB image, an RGB image you have at each and every point, you have three pixels that are capturing either the red, the green, and the blue. Okay, so this is how a usual camera would look like. The green, which is in the center of the wavelength uh, that we are looking at, would be half of the pixels in your camera. The blue and the red, each one would get a quarter of the resolution. This is where the red would be. And this is, a call, this is called the mosaic image. From the mosaic image, usually you interpolate for the missing red and the blues and you fill in the rest and you get three channels, sorry. Uh, three color channels, red, green, and blue, usually with the same resolution. And then what would happen is that you would uh, pipe it into a JPEG compression and the JPEG compression would first of all take these RGB and translate them into YCBCR, Y in high resolution, CBCR in low resolution. And each of these channels would be coded with a, a patch with patches of eight by eight, usually eight by eight, using the cosine transform that we have talked about. Okay, so this is how the classical uh, JPEG, and again, then the DC, the um, average of each and every patch is fed into something which is called run, run length coding. Uh, assume that there are no change, changes in the values and if there are, then you pay relatively high number of bits for these changes. Um, and the rest of them are used um, uh, with something with another entropy coder. I mean, you just travel along these points and uh, as you would like to have higher quality, you add more coefficients. And when you use low, small coefficients, when you use low quality, you use small coefficients. So if, for example, you can uh, play with your quality of your JPEG and you really take it to the limit, what you would get at the end of the day are just patches of eight by eight pixels, which are constants, okay? So this is a really low resolution image. And then somebody that took this course would argue, why? I mean, can't you do better? And the answer is obviously yes. And there are multi-resolution uh, versions of that. Uh, but again, most of the coders, uh, when you play with the quality, would not play with the resolution, but rather just uh, throw away coefficients from these in a perceptual, in a perceptual way uh, from this matrix. And in the end of the day, you would converge to a single value per, uh, per uh, matrix. Okay, Sean, now you had some interesting questions that I wanted to answer and probably I completely neglected them. This was a core dump, again, as I promised you from uh, 30K feet of this field. Now, just a comment before we go into break. Um, images are, can now be treated in a two-dimensional fashion and um, uh, there is something which is called, um, you, you probably know better than me, uh, which is called neural network. And there is also a version of neural network which is called encoder decoder. Okay. This is an encoder and this is decoder. Or that. Um, and you can train networks to do really crazy things of taking images, a specific kind of family of images, and there is a, this is this doesn't have to be linear; it could be nonlinear. And then, uh, if you train this network to code and decode a specific set of images, then you can really live in this relatively low-dimensional space and use this as your new way of coding information. But and it is really, really important, all the intuition that you gained in PCA, for example, the fact that you need to really align your data first, rather than just looking at shifted versions, otherwise uh, your PCA would not work, still work here. I mean, if you, a neural network find it really difficult, for example, to multiply numbers. They're really good at convolving, at convolution, multiplying with fixed numbers and then shifting. But if you need this number to be multiplied by that one, uh, the number of layers that you would need in, in your network would be log n, uh, 
uh, where n is the number of bits that you need to represent each and every of these numbers. So you need a really large number of layers in order to do multiplications between values of pixels, for example. If you know, if you know that, and if you know that uh, alignment is very important and you can do the motion estimation before you feed your stuff into, uh, into a neural network, then I would say you can do magic. I haven't seen it happening yet, but this is mainly because I didn't follow the field of coding uh, using a neural network, but I assume that in the near future, for specific family of images, you would see specific encoders, decoders that are trained uh, with a specific network. And I foresee the future where for a specific video, for, for a specific movie, you would also have to download the specific network that would do the best compression for the specific movie. And this is something that, I mean, downloading the number of um, coefficients you have in a neural network, even if it would be one, one million or one giga, uh, with, if you have a really high resolution video that you would like to capture all the essence, then, then uh, you could really do magic with stuff like that, okay? Or for a specific genre, you would have a specific uh, kind of networks. Um, so again, this is where the future is going. The computers are becoming more efficient and more efficient, and they would capture the, uh, these transforms that are working on your data in a more efficient way. And uh, in order to get there properly, you really need to understand what is the convolution, because at the end of the day, the first layers of this network would be convolutions, not cyclic, but rather convolutions. You need to understand what is the complexity involved in these convolutions. Um, what is, I mean, if you'd like to have quantization here, uh, what would be the meaning? I mean, what would it mean to quantize these coefficients in the, uh, this is co usually called latent space, okay? In this low dimensional coded version. Uh, would it make sense to code the decoder and send it to the, through a network to the, uh, to the user to decode what you're transmitting uh, right now. And these are things that you would be busy doing. I mean, uh, I'm doing geometry uh, during the last, I would say, decade and a half, which is a much more beautiful uh, field, if you ask me. Uh, if there are no questions, let's... Questions? I can, I can ask in the break. I don't hear you. Just a second. Just a second. I feel yeah. like to ask in the break. Again, sorry. Please, please ask the question again. Can you hear oh. me? Yeah, now I can hear you. I said I said I can ask in the break. Okay. I have a question. So, so just uh, let, let's define the break. The break would be back. We'll be back at eleven. Yeah. Questions. I had a question about the CBCR. First of all, how many beats do we have for for each one, and what does it stand for? The stand stands for the B and the R. Okay. Um, how many bits? Usually, the red, green, and blue. Blue, uh, you get between eight to sixteen bits. So obviously, it's not fixed, but usually, this is uh, this is where the low resolution cameras would work. Uh, this is. Uh, where the high resolution cameras would work, usually the number of effective bits in most CMOS sensors would be 12 bits, okay? Now, converting it into YCBCR, you have the freedom to do whatever you like. Usually you work with eight bits in each of them, um, but I have seen uh, applications where you have 12 bits here and where you have lower number of bits here. But again, these are isotheric applications. I, I can't guarantee anything. Now, where does this CBCR is coming from? How much do you want to know about it? Let me, let me, okay, let me try to give a really rough uh, explanation. Uh, people in the previous century, in the 20s, were really intrigued by the human perception. And what they did is they placed people in front of uh, monitors with, uh, but the monitors were not, uh, were, were, uh, where you had these kind of colors and they changed the colors until the person said, look, now I see what is the difference between the left and the right. So they were measuring the human sensitivity to color perception. 
Now you feed this huge number of uh, tests into a huge number. Think about it as an uh, autocorrelation matrix, okay? Think about it as R, okay? Of uh, the sensitivity of all people. Now, if by some luck this R has, uh, is, is, has two dimensions, I mean, has rank two, then we are really lucky. You can put the human perception in a two dimensional space. And this is, again, roughly speaking, what they have done. So when you plot the human perception as a two dimensional space, what you get is, is a curve like that that includes all the monochromatic numbers. And there is a space like that. And these two axes, axes are just random perception axes. And they were called A and B. And uh, after some manipulation at the, uh, at the end of the day, uh, they were translated into R uh, uh, and B. So this is where the color, the chromatic CR and the chromatic CB are coming from. Now, here are all the monochromatic, the laser colors that, are, uh, that you can think of, okay? This is an imaginary axis. Here, what you have at the center is the white, okay? So you can think of the fact that there is another axis that, um, that goes out of the board. Uh, I don't know how to do that. Um, let me try to do it like that. You can see the axis like that, and there is another axis that goes like that, and this would be the intensity, okay? Um, now, Usually when you design a television or a camera or a printer, what you would like to do is pick three or more colors that would capture most of the, most of this uh, uh, range of colors that are being perceived by human, by, by people. So this is the region where uh, you have the color perception. And what you would do is say, look, I would like to pick this one to be my, uh, uh, my uh, first color, this one to be my second color, this one to be my third color. And it appears that the linear combination of these colors would span a triangle that would look like that. So in HP and in your um, uh, monitors, the, most of the art went to how to choose these uh, these three dominant colors, these R, G, and B, or the, uh, the other ones, uh, that would give you the best cover over the human perception uh, horseshoe that you have here. By the way, the reason that uh, we are two-dimensional in perception is the fact that we have uh, this kind of three uh, sensors in the eyes that are called um, cones. Okay, the cones are the so think of the eye as having three kinds of receptors. One of them corresponds to red, the other one green, and the third one blue. And they are not exactly uh, red, green, and blue. If you look at the wavelength, then the red is something that goes something like that. This is the wavelength. The green is at the center, and the blue goes like that. And obviously, when you have a red image, the blue sensor would, uh, would react. And when you have blue color, the red sensor would react. And obviously the green would react almost everywhere. But they are dominant at their own colors. And you also have these, uh, uh, um, these uh, roads that are a, different, a completely different kind of sensor, which is a sensor that operates mainly at night. And it, is, uh, it captures the uh, achromatic. Uh, it is really sensitive, but not to colors, OK? So. Looking at human perception, uh, designers, engineers try to um, uh, fit this data into this autocorrelation matrix, then plot that into, uh, into this um, two dimensional domain. And indeed, it, the rank uh, was about two. And this is what says that the human perception is two dimensional. And this is where the CB and CR uh, originated from. Okay. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but because here I showed you that the CBCR, that the CBCR are a direct consequence of that, and this is how you work. It's things are a little bit more complicated, but not much. Okay, so this is this is where this uh, history. This is a brief history of color perception and where the chromatic. So C is for chromatic, and red and B, R and B are coming from this arbitrary axis that you would get when projecting the color perception into the principal axis, if you will.
Okay, thank you. What was another question? Ryan, um, right, yeah. about the neural networks, uh, uh, does it, we need to throw away all the, uh, the the other jobs with all the uh, transforms or we can feed the, the network with them and get uh, better results? So this is a very interesting question. So what, what Barack was asking is, should we treat pixels uh, as they come from the camera and then feed them into the network or could we massage somehow the pixel and come up with new feature? For example, why should we do uh, like uh, RGB into YCBCR? or something like that, or some other things, I mean, especially. So my answer would be the following. If your transformation would be local, would be just transforming the RGB uh, into something else, um, then what you can do, and in fact, we did it in some experiments, you can do RGB and you can also feed R squared, B squared, G squared, and the multiplication of R, G, R, B, Etc. Etc. So you can add uh, this vector into your network, and believe me, it is guaranteed that you would get better results. And if you do it in your research, please refer to uh, to um, more Joseph Rivlin. I think she's right. She's writing it like that as the origin for that, because we did it, for example, for uh, looking at uh, three-dimensional points in space. And indeed, if you do that, your network would be much more efficient. I mean, much more efficient in the sense of the number of layers that you would require. Now, if you think of trying to use some spatial uh, uh, things like, so if it's just convolving your patch with something, then uh, I would say that the network could do the job for you uh, because the network is good at that. But if you are looking at more complicated nonlinear things like multiplying the values of pixels with themselves, then yes, do it as an, as an, a, priori, uh, as an a priori filter, okay? So this would be the rule of thumb of when to do what is known feature, uh, uh, lifting into some uh, feature space before you let the network take the brain, take the data for you. So if for example, you would like to code faces, it is really important that you first of all align all the, fa all the faces. Otherwise, you'd have your network would find it really difficult to do the job for you. I mean, the, the shifting would be really complicated. Um, if you do RGB to YCBCR and it's a linear transformation, the network could do it for you. If you do RGB to YCBCR and there are higher moments in the game, then uh, feed the higher order to the, to the network and refer to more Joseph. This is important. She needs to get more credit than she got until now. The moments, this is not a new idea, uh, but she really showed that it is important when you do uh, this kind of, of, of a job. All right, did I answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, um, Juan, I have another one. Sure, Ivan. Um, can you go back uh, previous slides? Which one? It's about a Ganga doll. Yeah, more, more, more. You'll tell me when. Yeah, here, 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 here. This one? Uh, yes. So uh, I wanted to ask about the Laplacian. Uh, I'm not familiar with this operator. I just want to ask uh, what it means. Uh, I understand that it's uh, in some sense like. Uh, it's not like it's like it's a second order derivative, order. but. Uh, it, is but a, it, it is a second order derivative. Let, let me write the Laplacian and show you how. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is the second order derivative? Okay, so let me go to this writing like that. Uh, what is psi prime? Okay, so psi prime is taking my d over dt and applying it to psi. You agree with that? that I haven't done anything that you haven't seen before. Yeah, but, but there it's a vector, not a function. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Okay. Now, now we approximate it, okay? So psi was a function and now I'm sampling it as we did in the in the in the course and now psi would be psi one psi two these are the numbers that are corresponding to my psi okay and now I would like to approximate the derivative at this point how should I do that 
what I would do is I would subtract the, this value, let's do it in red, this value from that value, okay? And divide by the distance between them. You agree with me that this would be a derivative? Yes. Okay, so this would be an approximation of, of a derivative. Oh, approximation, yeah. Yeah, so let's do this approximation. I would have uh, minus one and one here and zero at the rest. And I would have minus one and one and zero at the rest. And minus one along the diagonal and one along the off diagonal. And here I should also have assumed that the distance between these two is H. So I should have one over H here, okay? So this would be an approximation of a derivative. So this would be an approximation of a derivative. Why? Because if I take the first row times my vector, then the first, uh, then the first output would be uh, phi two minus phi one, okay? The second row times this vector would be uh, phi three minus phi two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this would be, and there would be one over H here, okay? Mm -hmm. H is the interval, right? Yeah, and that's for, um, let's keep H, okay? Now, what would be the second order derivative? The second order derivative would be nothing but applying, I mean, if I would write it like that, it would be nothing but applying another derivative here. You agree with me? Yes. Now, writing it as operator is a little bit tricky, but uh, we can do that. So this would be, let's call this operator D. Okay, this is the derivative operator. Okay, so how do I get the Laplacian? This would be uh, in, 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 in um, calculus, we call it D dt squared, okay, that is operating on psi. Okay, this is how multiply we... uh, by d square. So is it d square? I, I think, uh, believe, well, let's, let's do it. Let's, uh, let's, first of all, let's look at how it would look like. Let's take uh, this derivative minus this derivative divided by h, and this would be my second order approximation, okay? So the, the stencil that I would use would be uh, one minus two, one, okay? So it would be minus two along the diagonal and one along the off diagonal, okay? This is how the operator should look like. And you could put one over H squared here. I mean, it would be, it would be, uh, this signal, minus one, one, zero, 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 okay, convolved by this signal, minus one, one, zero, zero, zero. Okay, this is the first derivative that I apply with the second derivative. Look at, look at what is going on here. If, for example, my signal would have been cyclic, Okay, if the if the if psi would have been cyclic, then what I have here is basically a convolution by this, by the first line that I have here, by the first row that I have here. Are you with me, Liran? Yes, I'm with you. But uh... so second derivative. So se if you accept that, so second derivative would be applying the same convolution again. Okay. Now, if I would like to write it uh, in a matrix form. It appears that what I would have, now I need to think of how to, and then and prove it at home, is that I have D transpose times D, okay? The output of uh, a convolution is a map of, of two, of two uh, horizontal uh, vectors is a matrix? No, it would be a vector, but the vector applied as an operator, as a convolution operator to my psi mm. would be represented as a matrix. Okay, so the jump between convolving with the vector and representing the vector as a cyclic, as a, uh, as a circular matrix 
is the perceptual jump that I'm doing here, okay? So this one would be V, this one would be V shifted with the rotational transformation. So the Laplacian is defined as this kind of a vector. Okay? Okay. Now, if I write, let's do uh, the step that I was missing before. If I write the L2 norm of my derivative as such. Okay, so it's basically taking the inner product of the psi that would give me a vector with the psi. Okay, this is writing things formally. Okay, doing it properly, it would mean that what I uh, basically do is take this one transpose time this one. So it would be psi transpose d transpose d psi. Again, remember that the output is a scalar. Okay, why? Because this would be a vector like that. D would be a matrix n by n. D transpose would be a matrix n by n. And uh, psi would be a vector like that. So from here, I would get a vector. From here, I would still get a vector. And a vector times vector would be a scalar. Okay, so dimension-wise, dimension I'm fine. Now, what I'm saying is that what I have here is psi transpose Laplacian. I call this operator Laplacian psi. This is it. The Laplacian is the uh, operator that I need to diagonalize in order to optimally represent these kind of, of, of functions. Now, it's a little bit more delicate than what I've shown you here, but if you really like to go uh, through the uh, strong link uh, between the um, between the uh, diagonalizing the Laplacian and diagonalizing the autocorrelation matrix, then please, please, please go to the paper by Aflalo. Brazis, Chaim Brazis. Everything there is done for the discrete case. Um, and there is a uh, Brookstein, and there is a uh, Sochen, and there is also myself. Okay. And over there, what we do is we show that we, we uh, represent the constraint as an operator, and everything is done in a very simple manner. It's not, you don't need uh, sophisticated mathematics, you just need pure algebra in order to uh, understand these links. But again, this goes beyond the material of this course. What you need to do for this course is just know that uh, the optimal way of representing these kind of functions uh, is by taking the eigenfunctions of this operator. Okay, now please let me have uh, five minutes to prepare something to drink and then we'll meet, so back, be back, sorry for in 11, let's do it five.
on the minute. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. I don't want to take uh, all your break. Uh, no, 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 it's fine. Okay. So you said that, that uh, what uh, I should take from this is that I didn't really understand the, what you said. Please be specific. About the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. Mm -hmm. what, what's the important thing that uh, I should the, take from it? If you have an operator, D could be any operator, okay? It doesn't have to be the, the, the derivative. It could be any operator, okay? And if you look at the L2 norm of the operator, uh, then the eigenfunctions of this D transpose D operators are the eigenfunctions that you would use if you have something which is different than the Laplacian. If it is the Laplacian, then we learned about it. Okay, what you get uh, in the simple case where you have a domain which is sampled uniformly, uh, then what you get is nothing but a Fourier transform, okay? What you get are the Fourier, the, the, eigenfunctions, Fourier functions. the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian are nothing but the Fourier. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they are also ordered from the large value uh, from the, um, uh, what is called the low frequency. First of all, it would be the flat, the constant, then it would be, the, 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 first of all, it would be the flat, the average, then it would be the first harmonic, then it would be the second harmonic, et cetera, et cetera. These are the eigenfunctions of the Fourier. But you can think of more complicated domains. For example, you can think of a sphere. Okay, assume that you have a sphere. You can define the Laplacian on a sphere. There is no problem doing that. I mean, it's not, it's called the Laplace Batrami, but it's, it's, there is a way of taking a second derivative of a sphere. If you diagonalize the second derivative of a sphere, what you'd get is spherical harmonics, which is nothing but an extension of the Fourier to a sphere. Uh, you can think of more complicated domains. It doesn't have to be a sphere. It could be any curved domain. It could be something that looks like that. Okay, but how does this fact help me? Oh, you know that in order to represent smooth functions on this domain, smooth these are smooth functions, okay? Then what you need to do is take these eigenfunctions, order them as soldiers, the, the one that correspond to the smallest eigenvalue until the one that correspond to the largest eigenvalue, and you get the basis, the, the, the most natural basis of representing your smooth functions. Mm. Let me okay. give you an example. Let me give you an example. This is yeah, that, that's what we do in the PCA. In the PCA, you do exactly the opposite. In the PCA, let, let me oh, let me you, give, you, okay. let me give you an example, and then and then we could uh, we could uh, relate to that. Okay. Um, the example would, would look like that. Assume that I'm looking at a, on a, on a sheet of on a sheet of paper on an x y coordinate. And now I'm looking for the Laplacian for this uh, sheet of paper. And the output of the, for the, of the Laplacian would be, I mean, this is how the derivative would look like. It would be my D and D transpose. And the Laplacian would produce for me the betas, which would be nothing but the Fourier transform, okay? Now assume that I have something, some functions, for example, faces. I have faces. This would be the first face. Okay, so this would be uh, Psi one. Psi two would be something like that, Asian. Psi three would be something like that. Angry man, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Now I took all these psi's and I'm constructing the autocorrelation matrix. I mean, think about uh, the ability of column stacking my vectors into a huge vector and then outer, doing the outer product of each phase with respect to each phase. And then what I would get is the autocorrelation matrix that I then decompose using SVD and get the first eigenvectors, we call them U, U1 and U2. Now, just a hint, what would be the U1? I mean, okay, let's do it the opposite. What would be uh, beta one in the Laplacian case? What would be the first, the first eigenvector that you would use 
in order to represent any smooth signal? The constant one? I mean, the, the constant. constant. Excellent. So the first one was the constant one. What would be the first one in the uh, PCA? The, the, the same one. You want uh, the one that represented the best. So it would be the average of all of all the faces that you have. Okay, so it would be the average of all the faces because because the PCA would give you uh, the average as the first uh, eigenvector. Okay, and then the second one would include higher derivatives and higher derivatives. In fact, for faces, there is something which is called eigenfaces that you could look it up. And people were trying to uh, use eigenfaces in order to represent and then even to recognize faces. So what they did is they took a face, they aligned the face so that it would fit into some, I, I would say 60 by 60 uh, image so that the eyes are more or less at the same location and everything is the same. And then what they did is they projected it onto an eigenfaces basis and looked at the coefficients. So they took a face, let's call the face F, and they projected it into a U1, and they got, uh, let's call it alpha one, and then projected the face, the same face into U2, and they got alpha two. So you can use it in order to represent the face in a compact way, if the face would have been smooth, but what they did is they used the, these alphas in order to, as features in order to rec uh, recognize faces. And it made a lot of noise, but let, let me tell you that uh, this was not the best way of uh, uh, recognizing people. But if you look at eigenfaces, it is a very uh, interesting way of looking at, uh, at uh, faces. In fact, it grew out of, um, it's, called, it's called MITization. Uh, it was published in MIT, but before that, there were two people from Brown University that uh, uh, did something that is called Eigen Pictures. So Eigen Pictures is the same idea. You, say, you take the same picture, you align all the pictures, then you column stack them, you cross them with themselves, you create an autocorrelation matrix, you uh, apply SVD to this matrix and you get these eigenvectors. And these eigenvectors are your basis for representation in an optimal way from a second order statistics point of view. Okay. So th there is a fundamental difference between the two. The uh, Laplacian would give you the smoothest possible functions. The PCA would give you uh, the functions that correspond to your second order statistics. I don't see how they can align unless all your functions are somehow flat and you, I mean, I don't see how they could align. And, and I also showed you a way to marry them, to, to uh, get these unrelated uh, structures and merge them together by looking at the, um, at the optimization that you're using in order to, uh, to, to get the PCA and the optimization that you would get in order to get the, uh, the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. Okay. Okay, so back to back to reality. Okay, so um, in the previous lecture, we talked about the PCA and, and what we did um, is order the eigenfunctions from the largest to the smallest and, um, and uh, use the, um, um, and, and then look at, and, and then, and then uh, we assume previously that the average is equal to zero. Now, assume for a moment that the average of all your data is not equal to the zero. What would happen then? Uh, then what happens is that if you look at the autocorrelation, it would look like that. This is the, um, this is the vector for which uh, the average is zero. And this is the, uh, the non-zero shift, okay? This is the average, which is non-zero. And if you look at the autocorrelation, it, it would be equivalent, we have seen it before, to the autocorrelation of the centralized vector and, um, um, and the cross product and the outer product of the, um, uh, of the average one, okay? So again, and this, this goes for non-deterministic as, as well as for deterministic uh, functions. So there is a way, if you know what is the average, there is a way to always subtract it from the, uh, 
autocorrelation matrix and obtain the more efficient PCA, if you will. Okay, now we are ready to uh, go to the, to the second part. And in the second, um, in the last part of this lecture, and again, I promise you that if we finish ahead of time and from some reason this, uh, this semester, the rate of uh, convergence for me is about 30% uh, or 20% faster than usual, because everything is already written and I don't have to write too much. So, so from some reason it goes relatively fast. I hope that I don't lose you along the way. If I do, please stop me. Ask me general questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, I don't know how many of you went to boot camp here or not, but this is a, a way of uh, stealing time. So I, I'll be really happy if you do that. Um, Again, so what we do now is we assume that, um, I mean, okay, until now what we did is minimize some representation error using only K elements, uh, using only K elements uh, where we have a vector of N components. Um, and obviously this N was an approximation of my continuum. Uh, we also mentioned the uh, relation to the Karuna left transform Coronal transform is basically taking the, the uh, eigenfunctions or the eigenstructure of the of the autocorrelation matrix, if you will. Okay, and then we actually uh, got to, to the PCA, exploiting the fact that we can uh, decompose the autocorrelation matrix using SPD, singular value decomposition. What we'll do now um, is we'll apply very very similar tools in order to um, in order to uh, use, in order to reconstruct signals out of their noisy and transformed data. So what we do is we, uh, we assume that the distortion is given by a linear operator. So there is some H uh, that is operating on my signal and there is some noise that is added to the signal. Okay, so the, we say that the noise is additive and we mentioned that if it is multiplicative, we can always take the log and hope for the best. Um, and we assume that the statistics of the noise and the statistics of the signal are independent. I mean, they, they are not related to one another, which is a really strong assumption. Usually the noise is a function of the uh, signals. I mean, the higher the signal, usually the higher the noise. So you, we will have to deal with that as well. Okay, so this is how it works. I have a statistical process from which I um, I guess I, I obtain one signal. The signal um, is operated on by some linear, uh, linear uh, transformation, linear distortion. And uh, this is the output in the first question. Then I also have a noise, okay? And from this statistical way of treating the noise, I pick up a specific realization of the noise. And the final data is given to me as the linear operator operating on my signal plus the random noise. And note that omega and omega tilde are different. These are different random processes, okay? Why? Because it would be much simpler to analyze this way. Now, given the data, what we would like to do is reconstruct back the input to the system. Why? Because it is important if I'm taking a picture and this picture was distorted by some uh, filter, by some something which is unwanted, unrelated, I would like to extract back the original image. Okay, so what we need to do is find an M, a um, calligraphic M, an inverse filter, if you like, that would take as input my given data. And the output would be an estimation of my uh, original signal. Okay, of my input to the to the system. Okay, and uh, obviously we need the measure to minimize. So the measure that we would minimize would be the L two uh, minimization. I mean the MSE, uh, which would be given as that some function of the uh, norm of subtracting the uh, um, uh, the original. Okay, this is, this is the original signal and the reconstructed one. And again, we write it without a specific selection of, of sigma because we would like it to be, to be optimal on average, okay? So here it would be the expectation operator that would come into play. And this is where the whole notion of statistics is so important. 
Okay, um, what can we assume about the signal? So again, we assume that uh, we know everything about the statistics of the signal. We know that it has an average mean, uh, sorry, that it has a mean which is equal to zero. And we assume that we know the autocorrelation matrix. So this is something that we can assume. And we assume that we also know the same about the noise. So the noise have an average which is equal to zero, zero mean. And we know that the uh, variance of the noise is given. And let's assume without loss of generality that uh, the autocorrelation matrix is given as a diagonal matrix. So each and every entry uh, in our noise, so if we think of the noise as a set of numbers, so each and every number like that is, is independent from another one. So there is no relation between them. And this is why we can actually write it as the following uh, diagonal matrix. Okay, this is how we can actually um, think of the autocorrelation as the following matrix. Okay, uh, now we also assume that the distortion is linear. And in most cases, we'll also assume that it is a shift invariant operator. So it is a convolution operator. Okay, and we also assume that there is no relation whatsoever between the uh, noise, the statistical appearance of the noise and the statistical appearance of the signal. And this is a really strong assumption. Usually we cannot uh, assume that and then we'll have to resort to more complicated scenarios, but let's assume for a moment that this is the case. Why can we assume that the noise is uh, IID? Uh, we can, oh, you, can't, oh. you can't, but here in order to simplify the uh, discussion, we do. Okay, so it's not without loss of generality, it is our assumption. With very specific, uh, with, with limiting the generality, <laughs> okay. uh, we, we zoom in into a very specific kind of noise. You will see that even for this specific kind of noise, things would be complicated. Now I can, what happens is that with noise, if these two are unrelated, <laughs> you can decorrelate uh, the, uh, the noise by taking eigen decomposition. I mean, assume that this would not have been the case, assume that you have some R of noise, then you can decorrelate the noise. You can take the eigen decomposition of this, uh, of this matrix and work in this domain. And then you have basically decorrelated the noise. You decorrelated the entries of the noise. Okay, so you can do that. But for the time being, let's assume that everything, and, and we'll do it later on, but for the time being, let's assume that everything is as written. And we also assume that the noise in additive, which is also a simplification of uh, what is going on. This is how the system looks like. We have a random process from which we pick up uh, one signal. We call it psi uh, omega zero. Then H is operating on the signal. Then we have our uh, W tilde from which we realize W tilde zero. And then the output would be uh, this guy, okay? And we look at the whole, uh, we look at it as, the, as a whole family of random processes. Um, we also assume that the uh, distortion matrix is given. So somebody is giving us a matrix or in the continuous case, uh, uh, this function that tells me how I convolve the uh, input with this kind of a function. And what we need to do is something which is called either an inverse filter or the convolution, okay? Because we convolved, then we call it the convolution, uh, where the input is our input data is psi data that is distortion by my H. And um, what we would like to assume is that among all possible reconstructed signals, we would like to find the one with minimal energy. Why? Because it would allow me to do something which is clever and we don't want to waste too much energy if we don't have to, okay? So assume that uh, the energy of the signal uh, is roughly known or we would like to minimize it. And we also assume that the second order statistics of the noise is known and the distortion operator is known. So everything is known statistically as well as deterministically about uh, the operator. Um, in the last lecture, I mean, uh, next week or two weeks from now, what we will learn is something which is called the Wiener filter. And the Wiener filter is a way of reconstructing Psi, uh, which is a realization of an unknown uh, random process uh, using the second order statistics of the noise and the signal itself. But we'll get there in, in, in steps, okay? 
For now, what we, what we do is we assume that we have the uh, autocorrelation of the noise and the autocorrelation of the signal, and they are independent. And from that, we'll, de we'll design the best linear assist signal uh, reconstruction operator, uh, and we'll do it one step at a time. Okay, what is a pseudo inverse? So for the time being, let's ignore the noise. So this is the end of the story. At the end of the story, we'll introduce noise, we'll use the autocorrelation of the noise, we'll use the autocorrelation of the signal. For the time being, assume that we don't have noise in the system. Okay, so this is a clean system. And the only thing that we do is having this um, uh, distortion function. And we would like to invent, to find the inverse distortion that we have, okay? Now, can we always do that? If we can do that, I mean, if we have an inverse filter to the filter that is operating on my signal, then it would obviously give me the identity. But the problem is that this H is rarely invertible. What do I mean by that? Let's do some examples. Let's first of all, look at the continuous function uh, that gets value between uh, between psi low and psi high. So this would be my function, and this would be psi high, and this would be my psi low, psi low and uh, it would uh, get values between zero and one. And uh, the, now I fit it into, into a filter, and the filter has an impulse response that, is, that looks like that. And uh, what is going on is that I uh, take my, sorry, my filter at each and every point, and I put it, assume that this is the filter here. So I average, um, the output would be a value at this point, which is the average according to this profile that you have over here. And in this point, you may have a different profile, okay? And this would be my H of T and uh, Xi. So for each and every Xi, uh, sorry, for each and every T uh, where I place my, uh, my uh, my filter, it would have a different shape. Or we can resolve to the simpler uh, equation where it is also shift invariant. And if it is shift invariant, it would have the same shape here and here, okay? It doesn't matter, I just shift it along the T axis. So this would be my output. I'm just reminding you things that we have learned before. And this would be the output of uh, convolving it with a, with a linear filter that we have over here. Okay, now we can also assume that everything is periodically extendable um, between uh, zero and one. So it's periodic and uh, extendable. Um, let's do the following. Let's write Psi in the Fourier space. So we use the Fourier functions in order to project Phi onto the Fourier functions. So these would be the coefficients Psi K. We do the same for the uh, filter, for the a linear filter that we apply on the function. So again, we project it onto the Fourier and we represent it into the Fourier domain. And now we uh, write the output signal as a convolution. We still write the same convolution, but now um, here would be my filter. This would be my filter. And this would be, and it would be sum by L for minus infinity to plus infinity. And here I have the signal itself. Okay, and this would be the sum of the signal. Now, since everything here is linear, I can push the integral uh, into, uh, into the, the, those that depend on psi. So I can push it here and I can pull uh, those that don't depend like these guys uh, out of the integration. So they would appear here. Uh, and the exponent that depends on T can also be uh, pushed out of the integration. And here I have just the integration of the exponent with L minus K. And this is something that we have seen to yield the uh, delta function. So if L is equal to K, what I do is integration over one and then I get one. If L is different than K, then I have two harmonics that interact with one another and the sum, the integration of the sum would be zero, okay? So uh, this would be the delta function. And therefore, I don't have to sum over both uh, L and K, but since I, what would happen at the end of the day is just uh, having uh, effective values when L is equal to K, then at the end of the day, what I get is nothing but multiplication of the coefficients of the signal times the coefficients of the uh, filter 
uh, in the uh, times the right Fourier function. Okay, so this is representing the output as a function of the Fourier coefficients of the signal, the Fourier coefficients of the filter uh, in the Fourier space. Okay, here this was just a reminder of things that we have done before. Okay, now what we would like to do is invert the uh, filter. Let's look at the coefficients of the uh, Fourier transform of the data. So this is the data, okay? And these are the Fourier uh, coefficients of the data. So we can write it as psi data k, okay? So this would be k equal one, two, three, from minus infinity to plus infinity. So we can write psi as the following term, where the coefficients, the Fourier coefficients are nothing but the Fourier coefficients of the signal times the Fourier coefficients of the, of the filter. Again, nothing is new here. What is new here is that you get, we get a really intuitive way of getting rid of uh, H here. How do we do that? Remember that what we are looking is a mechanism to get rid of the distortion. And this mechanism can be represented in the Fourier domain, assume that I can represent it in the Fourier domain, and it should be nothing but one over H of K. So if none of the Fourier coefficients of the distortion is equal to zero, I can invert it. So in principle, for perfect recovery, what we should do is have M that is operating on the data where the Fourier coefficients of M are one over K, one over H of K that multiplies the, uh, the data itself. Okay, everything is done here in the Fourier space. Okay, so it would be one over H that multiplies uh, H and therefore it would just give me back the original, uh, the original uh, signal, okay? The problem is that for some case, we could have HK equals to zero. And in fact, it is, it is even worse than that because practically we'll have values that are really close to zero and we'll have to decide whether they are zero or not. So uh, we are in a, even, even a, a bigger both. Um, so then the question is uh, what would happen at those case? Um, but if, if, for example, we could do that, I mean, if there is no uh, H for which HK is equal to zero, then we could have the filter that we would like to apply and representing it into the Fourier domain would be nothing but one, one over H of K times the corresponding Fourier function, okay? So this is how uh, we approach the problem. If everything is nice, if there are no, uh, if there are no uh, pathologies where, uh, where my H is equal to zero, then we can get a perfect reconstruction of the signal. But as we promised, it's not the case. So uh, now what we do is assume the following, deal, what we'll have to do is deal with the zero coefficients, okay? So uh, now we know that our data was defined as psi K times HK the, in the Fourier uh, domain and assume that uh, we have a couple of them which are equal to zero. We don't know if H is, um, um, okay, we'll, we'll know it in a moment. What we know is that psi K is equal to zero for all the Ks where the coefficients of uh, H are equal to zero, okay? Now, at these locations, for these frequencies, we cannot reconstruct psi of T. So for these frequencies, we cannot say anything about the input signal. So the default would be for this frequency to say that the frequency at the input signal is equal to zero, okay? Uh, would it be a perfect reconstruction? It would be a minimal energy reconstruction. Throwing away frequencies is in fact throwing away the energy uh, at these locations in the frequency domain. So uh, when the coefficient is equal to zero, what we do is we also say that psi k is equal to zero, okay? Because there are two options. One of them is that psi k originally was equal to zero and the other one is that hk was equal to zero. In the first case, we are right. In the second case, we do the best we can. So our 
reconstruction uh, filter would be one over k if the k is effective and it would be zero if h of k, if h of k was equal to zero. And the output, the reconstruction, uh, the coefficients in the Fourier domain would be h of k, uh, would be psi of k if there was an effective uh, value to the filter and it would be zero otherwise. So what would be the estimation error in this case? Okay, so let us write the estimation error as follows. It would be uh, some, and now we write everything in the, Fourier, in the Fourier space. So it would be the sum from minus infinity to infinity of my original vector times the estimated one. And we know that we need to zero all the ones for which h was zero. So it's basically the sum from minus, now remember, um, when we do the inner product of uh, the functions, the Fourier functions with themselves, they are orthogonal. So at the end of the day, we just need to sum over the case. We don't need to, I mean, the, the cross product between all these uh, frequencies yield the fact that what we have here is nothing but identity. Okay, nothing but one uh, for, for, um, um, uh, for K equal to, to itself, okay? So what we have is nothing but sum over all the points at which k is equal to zero of the Fourier coefficients uh, of my signal. I don't know if I mentioned that, but the energy of the signal could be represented in the frequency domain, in the Fourier domain, and this is called the Perceval. Perceval equality. But it's, it's not important to our discussion, so let's uh, remove it from the discussion. But what we see over here is that the energy, the energy of the error is equal to the energy of the coefficients that I was unable to reconstruct, okay? So Can this you explain was, again, the last one, the last um, stage the last, in the question? The yes, equation. exactly. Yeah, okay, so, thank you. So let's move- It should be absolute uh, value, I think in the integral which one this one the... yeah you're right this is the second norm well what is written here basically uh the square here is summing over all k of something that multiplies an exponent times something which is sum of l exponent with a minus L, okay? Now, these two are uh, samples of an orthonormal basis, okay? And there is an integration here. So they would survive. I mean, so I have to do sum of K, sum of L, et cetera, et cetera, as we did before. And here I have integration over minus K, um, minus L, plus L. And they would survive only if k is equal to L, okay? So I could, so this would be equivalent to identity. So this is the step that I uh, jump from here to here. Now integration over the, uh, over the, when k is equal to L, the integration would be equal obviously to one, okay? So this is why I get at the end of the day that the energy of the, error would be nothing but summing over all the coefficients with, that were not reconstructed. Okay. Now mentioning the Perceval, let me just tell you that if, for example, we would like, we would like to measure the energy of a signal. Okay, so the energy of some signal Could be written as okay. Could be written as the energy of the signal written in the Fourier space. So it would be some alphas. Let's call them k, e, and here I have minus k. With all the two pi, etc., uh, etc., et and here I have another sum of l's, of alpha l's, e plus l. DT, so I can do the same. I can take the sums out 
I can to do the alpha L, alpha K, alpha L, and I have the integration over the uh, L minus K. And again, this one is again the delta LK, L minus K, sorry. So at the end of the day, what I would get here is that I would get equation, uh, equality of sum of K of alpha K squared. So the energy of the signal is nothing but the sum of the squared of the coefficients of the signal projected onto its Fourier uh, domain, Fourier functions. Okay, and here, this is nothing but repeating the same idea for the, uh, for the error, for the reconstruction error. Juan, can you explain again uh, how this operator works? Which one? Uh, mu. We're talking about uh, mu here, right? Oh, the calligraphic M. Yeah. Yeah, I can. This, this, is, the, this is the definition of M. Um, if you take your function, okay, you take your function, it's a periodic function. And since it, since it is periodic, you can represent it into, into the, in the Fourier domain as infinite number of coefficients. Okay, this is my function. This is my function psi. And this is how it is represented in the, we called it, we call this one psi of t and we call this one psi k. Okay. Mm -hmm. We do the same for the filter. This was the filter. It had some way of being grouped. So this was H of T. Okay. And again, it had some representation in the spectral domain. And since we can assume it is periodic, we mentioned that periodicity means discrete. So these are H of K. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we just divide each, uh, each parameter, the, the k parameter of the function. I'm enjoying the story, so let me, let me conclude. Okay. So now what happens is that I multiply each index here with each, in, in, with, with each index there, okay? So I'm multiplying the first by the first, the second by the second, et cetera, et cetera. And I have, and I have to sum, uh, and and this is how I'm getting my uh, my uh, my representation into the Fourier domain. So the output, the output would be multiplying this guy by that guy. I would get my this would be my psi k out. My reconstruction. We we wrote it with a hat here. Okay. And then the second one would be this guy by this guy. I would get the second one. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Now, from these guys, I would like to reconstruct the purple ones. Okay, how do I do that? I need to take each and every uh, each and every value here and divide it by I mean by one over the red value there. Okay. This is exactly what is going on. And then I would get the, and then I would be able to get from this black back into this purple. So you, mul so you multiply each uh, coefficient, the K coefficient by MK, right? By MK, yeah. So MK is indeed one over HK. Okay, so that's what it is. Yeah. So, um, now, if we don't have any additional information about our signal, then indeed what we have is that our, the energy of a reconstructed signal is uh, the energy of all the coefficients at which h was not equal to zero. Why? Because if, for example, uh, this h was equal to zero, then the output here would be equal to zero. And there is no way to, to reconstruct back the uh, relevant signal here because I, I have no way of inverting the influence of this HK, okay? So the error would be, the energy of the signal would be just uh, the energy of all coefficients for which H was not equal to zero and the rest of them would be equal to zero. Um, so if we, if we do any other selection, 
of, uh, of a filter at these points, um, we wouldn't, uh, I mean, uh, we wouldn't do much good because the output is equal to zero. So inverting zero by something would not cause any, I mean, we would not do anything. So we call it the minimal energy estimator, okay? Why is it the minimal energy estimator? Because if we are minimizing the reconstruction uh, signal that we would like to get subject to the observed data, which is equal to the, my convolution with the H, then what we need to do is pick just the values at which, at which H of K is different than zero and, uh, uh, and uh, let MK be equal to one over HK. And at the rest of the domain, where HK is equal to zero, we just need to say that psi out of psi hat of k is equal to zero, okay? Okay, by the way, if we, we could inject uh, frequencies there, but they would be arbitrary. They would be, they would correspond to something that we would like to do rather than anything to do, anything that has to do with the original signal, unless we, does, we know something about the original signal. Why sh shouldn't we just take uh, the, the, co the coefficient uh, with the noise of that frequency? Wait, we don't have any noise yet. Mm. We don't have any noise yet. Wait, noise, noise would, would come to the game and will complicate things a little bit, but not much. So this is the clean problem. This is uh, the cleanest that you can think of. So what happens now, given my, uh, my, now this is the discrete case, exactly the same. I have my, uh, my vector and I have my data, which is nothing but my H operating on my vector. And what I would like to find is an inverse of the H, uh, of the H matrix. And matrices can be inverted if they are invertible, but if they are not invertible, they cannot be inverted and we have to invade, invent something. So if my H is invertible, then we can solve the problem. Otherwise, if H is not invertible, then we have to do something else. And what we, we will do is go back into our single good old SVD and uh, do some magic in order to do very similar things to what we have done here. I mean, very similar things to those can be obtained by uh, in an algebraic manner. And you can imagine how it would look like. Uh, the zero eigenvalues uh, would have to be treated in some other fashion, okay? So some comments about SVD, just to remind you, assume that I have a matrix that looks like that, okay? Uh, in the complex or in the real space, in the real domain, the singular value of the composition can be shown as follows. It is a U function that looks like that. Sorry, this was my M, this was my U, this is my U and this is my Sigma and this is my V. So the U and the V are uh, unitary matrices, okay? So U is a unitary matrix and the size of U is M by M. And uh, the uh, V is a unitary matrix and the size of uh, V is N by N. And here I have uh, what is known as the singular values and the singular values are, have really nice connections uh, to, the, uh, to the M matrix. In a moment, we'll see exactly how. Now, the number of singular values that I would have is equivalent to the rank of the huge matrix, okay? So I would have at most uh, P values and at the rest, I would just have zeros, okay? So P would obviously be the minimum among M and N, uh, and the rest of them would be, uh, would be smaller than the minimum between M and N, and the rest of them would be equal to zero. Now, what is the relation between these singular values? And in a moment, we'll also see that there is some ambiguity of selecting these singular values and the, um, and the eigen, and some eigen functions and eigen vectors of something which, which we can diagonalize. I mean, we know how to diagonalize uh, matrices uh, that have n by n by n or m by m. Okay, this is something that we can work with. The question is, what do we do here? So what we do here is the following. We claim that these numbers, these singular values, uh, which are called singular values of m, are in fact related to the eigen vectors of the following of m times m transpose and uh, m transpose times m. Okay. 
So what we say is the following. Um, U and V are the result of uh, the spectral decomposition of M, M transpose and M transpose M. So U would relate to M, M transpose and V would relate to M transpose M. Now, if I'm taking a matrix times its transpose, what I'm getting is a symmetric matrix. Uh, it would also be non-negative and the rank would be the rank of each of its ingredients, okay? And the rank would be P, I cannot increase the rank. So assume that I can decompose M M transpose as follows, okay? For some U and um, uh, assume that these are the eigenvalues of this M M transpose, okay? It would be lambda one, lambda two, until lambda P. And obviously since um, uh, M is M by N, the, uh, the, um, uh, the matrix, the, the total matrix would be M by M, capital M by capital M. So obviously the uh, diagonal would be a diagonal of capital M by capital M. So there would be zeros along the diagonal. And also assume that we order them from uh, large to small. I mean, this is something that we can also always do. Um, we also um, uh, know that uh, M transpose M uh, is also of rank P. And we also know that it is symmetric and have the same eigenvalues, let's assume. Let's, let's, let's prove that. So let's assume that uh, x is an eigenvector and lambda is a, as an eigenvalue of m, m transpose or m, m conjugate, okay? Now what we will do is we will multiply both sides by m transpose. If we do that, what we get, and remember, lambda is a scalar. If we do that, then what we get is we get a new eigenvector that we denote as, let's call it y, which is equal to nothing but m conjugate times x, okay? And indeed, um, our new eigenvectors would serve as, as a new eigenvector with the same eigenvalues. So what we have is we are keeping the same eigenvalues but the eigenvectors of V now uh, would be uh, nothing but my Y's that we see that we see over here. So what we can do is we can write M transpose M as V. And here we have uh, lambda that goes between, now it should be small M, it should be N by N, I think. Yeah, it should be N by n here. Oh, sorry. This is this is the uh, this is the eigenvalues of m transpose n conjugate m, and here I have the n the uh, v conjugate. Okay, where v is nothing but a unitary uh, matrix. These are the set of eigenvectors, and uh, this is this is the diagonal matrix, which is exactly the same as before until p. But then I have a different set of uh, zeros. I mean. It, it depends if n is larger or smaller than small m. And again, we order them in the same order. So what we can see is that uh, if we have a matrix which is not, uh, which is not uh, any given matrix, we can uh, diagonalize it using something which is called single valid decomposition. Uh, some more properties, okay? What else can we say? We say that if we uh, write m, M conjugate, then we can now, instead of M, uh, write uh, the claim that we have done before. And indeed what we get is that it is equal to U sigma square, where sigma is nothing but uh, taking the two set of eigenvalues and multiplying them, uh, squaring each and every element because these are diagonal matrices. And the same goes for M transpose or M, M conjugate M. Okay, so it would be V, here U, uh, U conjugate U is a unitary matrix. So we get rid of that and this is what we get, okay? And now we have the relation between the sigmas, between the sigmas and the singular values, okay? What we see is that each and every uh, singular value uh, is in, squared is in fact the uh, equal to the eigenvalue. So what we need in order to get the singular values uh, is take the square root 
of the eigen of the eigenvalues. And there is ambiguity here that we will deal with later on. There is sign ambiguity, and in fact, it's, it is even worse than sign ambiguity. It is rotation in the complex space. Okay, and uh, in both cases, the last m minus p eigenvectors uh, are arbitrary selection. I mean, um, it's it's just setting them as an arbitrary subspace that we would like to that we would like to explore. What we could do is write m since these are arbitrary, and since here what I would have had are just zeros. Then what I can do is truncate. If we go backwards. What I can do is just truncate my sigma so that it would just be this lower part that we see over here, since the rest are uh, zeros anyway. Which means that what happens is that I can just um, truncate both v as well as p, so I can truncate my v's here. So let me just. Do the truncation properly, properly. So I could truncate the u's here and the v's there, so that they would be uh, uh, they would be m. Sorry, it would be m. Come on, m by p. And this would be n by p. And if we do it properly. Uh, this is what we'd get. So the matrix itself, which is m by n, is equal to my uh, m in this direction by p vectors that multiplies the effective eigen uh, singular values. And here I have the effective subspace in V that I need in order to uh, construct back my, my uh, matrix, my original matrix M. Okay, so this is how it is being reconstructed. So, now going back to my uh, to my uh, filter. Okay, I have my filter, and my filter is given as as this uh, h of size, for example, n by n. And I uh, do the decomposition of uh, of my filter into the uh, eigen eigen values. And this is the SVD. Okay, using SVD, uh, this is kind of uh, singular values and uh, another basis complementary matrix. And if I know that the rank is p, then I can write it as such. Okay, now let's write everything in this in uh, using the spectral decomposition. Spectral decomposition in this dual space, in this u and uh, v star. Okay, and immediately you can see what would happen when h would be uh, would be a convolution, where h would be circulant. Okay, then v uh, v star and v would be the DFT. But for an arbitrary H, they are not. And now we are living in the set of an arbitrary H. So we'll have two bases, one of them V and the other one is U, two unitary matrices. So uh, if we plug instead of H, the two unitary matrices, so this is the SVD. So from here, it would be applying SVD. Then what we can have is applying VK on my vector, each and every VK I applied on my, uh, so I'm, I'm running through all the vectors in each way I apply to my, uh, to my uh, signal uh, psi bar. And here I have to multiply that by the, um, uh, by the vector UK, okay? So I have psi bar that is multiplying, uh, to multiplying psi, this is VK. And what I would get is a scalar that would multiply a vector, and this vector would be nothing but u, k. Okay, which means that what I get here is the inner product between v k and psi bar uh, times the uh, in, represented uh, in the u k space. So this is strange. This is something that we haven't seen until now. The the data is represented as the coefficients of project, projecting psi in the v space. And these are the coefficients that uh, multiply my UK space, okay, in a different space. And they should be modulated by the corresponding eigenvalues of the, um, uh, of, the, of the SVD, the singular values of my filter. And again, this is as long as H is not uh, a result of an LSI process. 
Okay, otherwise U and V would coincide. Okay, um, so what should we do? We would like to recover Psi out of the data. And we know that the rank P is smaller than M. And uh, this is by analyzing the matrix H, which means that the matrix H is not invertible. Now, if by some luck Psi uh, P is equal to N, which means that it is invertible, then we can do the magic. We can just do H. Uh, we just invert the matrix, which is nothing but let's write everything in the SVD space. So instead of uh, H minus one, we can just do that. Um, now the minus one of the conjugate would just be V. The minus one of the uh, eigenvalues would just be the eigenvalues, one over the eigenvalues and uh, minus one of u would just be the conjugate. And this should multiply psi data. Now psi data can also be written, I mean, okay, so this can be done explicitly. Okay, so what we see is that we have to uh, project psi data onto the, onto the u space. Okay, so this is nothing about projecting the psi data onto the u space and then use it as coefficients that multiply uh, one over the singular values that multiply the V space, okay? Now, if P is unluckily smaller than N, then we have to somehow uh, use something else along the diagonal. And let's without, uh, without generality, just inject an arbitrary number epsilon here, okay? So again, now what we have is that P is smaller than N. So what we have to do is invert zero. And instead of inverting zero, what we do is we just assume that H is equal to zero along the diagonal of the original uh, the composition. So what we have right now, and with that we'll, we'll uh, stop for today. What we have right now is that given my regularized version of the filter, uh, the inverse of this regularized ver version uh, can be written as such. First of all, from K equals one to P, it is exactly as before. But for the rest of them, what we need to do is invert the epsilon. So we just multiply uh, the projection of Psi on U by epsilon to the power of uh, minus one, by one over epsilon, okay? And this would be the coefficient that multiplies VK. But, and this is very important, if we look at Psi data, we know that it is the outcome of the uh, multiplication of H by Psi. And if we write H explicitly, it would be nothing but using the SVD, it would be nothing but that, which is nothing but uh, using the singular values uh, and there is zero after P, which means that they reside in the uh, if we look at what is going on from here on, that they should reside only in the subspace of the first P uh, vectors of U. Okay, why? Because uh, this is what is going on. I mean, this is a linear combination of the first P vectors of U. Okay, this is what is going on here. What we have here is a set, is, a, is, a, um, um, is something that is truncating the rest of the domain from you, okay? So we know that for every K, which is in P plus one until N, what we have is that the projection of Psi data on UK is equal to zero. Let's just finish this story. It means that our reconstruction, uh, when we take one over this epsilon, okay? So we take one over the lambdas when, when K uh, is within the rank, the effective rank. And beyond the effective rank, what we do is we multiply by one over epsilon, but we know that what we multiply, the projection of psi data on UK is equal to zero because there is null there. So it multiplies zero. So what we have at the end of the day is that our reconstruction, no matter which zero we have selected is equal to nothing but what is written here the projection onto the um, effective rank uh, of the Psi data times the relevant VK. And again, it is independent of, uh, of uh, Epsilon. So 
we can choose any epsilon that we want. Uh, specifically, we can use epsilon to be infinity or zero. It doesn't really, uh, it does, well, it does matter, but if we use, for example, epsilon equals to infinity, then it would not matter much for, or close to infinity, it would not matter because we'd get the same, the same result. So our uh, psi epsilon is equal to our uh, psi that we have over here, which is equal to nothing but that. They are all the same. So now we define. What we do is instead of dealing with epsilon, what we'll deal is something which is called the pseudo inverse filter, which is taking, adopting all the previous effective eigenvectors, single of, single of values, and here just plugging zero, exactly as we did in the continuous case. So the inverse operator that is required to invert psi bar data to our original psi uh, is the best estimate uh, from the point of view of minimal energy uh, as we take epsilon to infinity, okay? And this is a completely legitimate selection of, uh, of the inverse filter. So this would be our, fil our uh, selected filter. And let's stop at this point. And in the next lecture, what we'll do uh, is we'll, um, we'll further analyze that. We'll start adding noise to the system. Um, we'll analyze the reconstruction error um, and, and we'll continue with the, we'll make some arguments about the, uh, what happens when we are dealing with H, which is also a linear shift invariant. And then we start adding the noise to the game. Questions? I have one. Um, I don't understand why it doesn't matter what value of epsilon we chose. Uh, wh why it uh, won't affect uh, the result? Because because your data, okay. If you if we look at these, sorry, this is not what I wanted to do. If we look at these eigenvalues at the end of the day, in the previous case. Some of them were zeroed. This is psi, this is, this is now my psi data. Some of them were zeroed by the filter, okay? Multiplying this number by any other number would not cause anything, but rather keeping this number as a zero. So anything which is different than zero that I uh, put here, for example, infinity would not affect the result. Specifically, if I would like to find my inverse filter, remember the inverse filter before were just numbers with, that were one over the H that cause uh, multiplication of two number to be, uh, to be given here. Here it is given to zero. So without loss of generality, I could select anything and the specific selection of selecting zero here would not make any difference. From an intuitive- Art, I don't understand something. Um, we... All, all the zero again values that we get, um, this is the rank. This is the rank. This is the rank of mm -hmm. of H for our filter. Okay. This is this is P is the rank of H. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the the rest of the values are something that are arbitrary, completely arbitrary. So I don't really care what is written here. They could be any any value that is written here. It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter because um, uh, because they would fall into the null space of my psi data. What well, the question is? Why for any the, the last sentence in this slide? Why for any k from p plus one to n, the inner product will be zero. So let's just multiply these two matrices, okay? Okay, so what happens is that, um, now I need to think about it. What happens is that I have my use. Oh, well, you, you agree with this notation? This is an explicit version of writing. This is the inner product of uh, V. Yeah. Okay, so this is the inner product. Mm -hmm. And then each of these coefficients is multiplying UK, a specific UK, by a specific uh, lambda I. Okay, so let, let me just remove some noise. Let me try to denoise it a little bit.
Let's see what is going on here. What I have here is that I have my V vector that is multiplying my Psi vector. So I get, I get uh, for each and every, so from that I'm getting a vector, okay? And now this vector is applied, now I apply this matrix by this vector, so I'm getting this one, okay? Okay. Now it multiplies, these are the coefficients that multiply the relevant U, the relevant vector in Q, okay? Mm -hmm. Now let's, let's see what is going on here. These guys are effective only between uh, one and P. Okay, so they are a linear combination of the first P vectors in U. So if, for example, I would like to see what if, if, if the if, uh, Psi data uh, has any component with U uh, P plus one, The, the outcome would be that is that it is it would be equal yeah, to that, that that's the case currently but if you change the eigen values from zero to some other value the, you will give them meaning in the, in the final result this is this is the given this is the given psi data now i start operating on psi data this is given okay it is given to me that psi data when i do the inner product with that i'm getting zero now I'm taking Psi data and I'm operating on this Psi data that belongs only to the first P eigen uh, space of U. Okay, here it does not. Okay, so now I'm operating on Psi data. Remember, Psi data belongs to a very specific set of, it belongs to only the first, first K vectors of U. Projecting them onto any other one, would always give me, so if I write here, Psi data projected onto UK, where UK is this guy, it would be equal to zero. Because this is how I constructed my Psi data. Oh, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And this is, now, this is now not the filter, but rather the reconstruction. This is my M, okay? The inverse filter that I'm trying to invent. And therefore, in the inverse filter, I'm allowed to play whatever, whatever play I'm, I would like to do. And this is the game that I'm playing. And in this game, what I've done is basically put zeros along the diagonal uh, beyond, beyond P. So this is, this is the allowed game that I'm allowed to play. I have placed zeros here. Okay, so, so you put those uh, epsilons just so you can inverse the matrix? Yeah, just to see that I can invert it. And um, at the end of the day, I just put zeros. And this is called the pseudo inverse because uh, it, this is, this is a well-defined notion. It basically tells you that um, if there is a space in which you don't know what to do, if the uh, span of uh, your span is between uh, one and P, and is P, uh, then beyond that it does and it would really matter what you do. So just choose zeros to be there. And this is the pseudo inverse, okay? So, this is basically it. More questions? Uh, but this is true only if it's you get actually zeros and not epsilons in the you are absolutely data. right. The big the big problem in inverting uh, filters is the fact that I would usually get something which is really close to zero and I would know how to invert it. But again, here we are doing with everything which is still synthetic and we allow ourselves to do whatever we like. So if the if the the filter can be characterized as something which is effective along along uh, some p and then it is something which is something that i can assume to be zero then my claim is that if you just do the pseudo inverse i mean just invert those uh, eigenvalues or singular values that you can rely on then what you'd get is the best reconstructions, best reconstruction in terms of minimal energy. Okay, this is it. This is my claim. 
And again, as I promised you, in a moment we'll add uh, the statistical, uh, we will know something about the statistical behavior of the signal. So we haven't used omega yet. The fact that we have some statistical knowledge about the data. Then what we'll, no, we'll, we'll do is add some statistical knowledge about, about the noise that we are adding to the system. Until now, the only thing that we do is use H as a linear filter uh, with some low rank. If it's not low rank, then there is no problem. If it's full rank, no problem, you can invert it. If it's low rank, just put zeros along the diagonal, you'd, be, uh, you'd minimize the energy of the, of the signal that you're reconstructing, that you're reconstructing. This is it. More? If not, then let's uh, resume next week. Enjoy the Segel. Uh, how did somebody told me those that uh, at a Segel? So enjoy the Segel and uh, invest some time in I don't know in, in uh, reading again the material of the course. I think I think it is it, it would give you a really good intuition uh, as you go to other domains where convolutions and and uh, analysis in dual domains are important. Okay, so playing with just a little bit of algebra uh, is a little bit challenging, but it makes sense because everything here is written in, in vector and matrix form, so you can follow it and, and understand what is going on. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.